good morning. We have the uh, opportunity to, to have General Spalding uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Spalding is the co-CEO of Q Networks. Q is a standalone 5G service and software platform built to power the automated world. Um, Q is built with native defense grade hardening and data security to withstand the rigors of modern autonomous of the modern autonomous battlefield, but it's available to protect Americans here at home as well. Um, Rob, I was just mentioning that, um, you know, we've had a very interesting morning. We had somebody in South Korea talking about the advanced foundations that South Korea's laid for 5G and, and all the incredible things they're already able to do that we can only think about doing right now. A uh, fellow in, in Las Vegas is talking about putting all the data together that we're producing and also making putting that into a secure framework because one of the big problems over the last couple of days, of course, is um, penetration of our most secure data assets all over the country. Big issues. And then, then we had three really interesting presentations from around the country, people who are struggling to put together a broadband for their communities, a, a, a Native American community up in far north Washington, then the Department of Transportation in Arizona and the Department of Transportation in uh, Tennessee. And, and it just really feeds into your point uh, about the fact that we, we do need some sort of a 5G network. We need to make this available for all and we need to build it here at home. So I, I, I think that um, the drum you've been beating over the last couple of years is, is really important. I'd just like to hear a little bit about your solution in terms of Q networks and, and what you think we should be doing uh, going forward as a country. Thanks, Norm, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on. So I think uh, if you're looking at the news today, the, the hacking of um, the Treasury Department, the Commerce Department, the Defense Department, uh, you know, really the entire federal government really just leaves us wondering what's, what's going to come next. You know, my experience is there's nothing that's sacred or safe anymore, and that's one of the reasons why uh, I wrote in the current national security strategy, we needed a secure nationwide 5G network. It was about protecting America's data, not just uh, the government data, but also uh, the data of our citizens, the data of our uh, corporations, because that's really the lifeblood of the 21st century. It powers AI, and it's the main reason why China seeks to become the Saudi Arabia of data, because they seek to dominate the, the AI uh, of the future, and they're well on their way to doing that. They have you know, twice the internet traffic rolling through China now, and with their Belt and Road Initiative, which includes the digital Silk Road, and their dominance of not just uh, in terms of Huawei, but all of 5G because of their dominance of the standards making bodies, then we have a very, very serious problem. It's almost as if, um, you know, if you go back to the development of the nuclear weapon, uh, the Chinese had nuclear weapons and nobody else did. That's where, that's the world that we find ourselves in today. So I thought I'd really just go over some key important points about 5G. First of all, everybody always talks about how 5G requires all these antennas and expensive deployment. And the first thing that when I got the engineers into the White House to talk about, they said, look, um, you know, we're, we're building in the high band, which is really millimeter wave. And, uh, and we are focused as a nation in building in that, our infrastructure in that band. If you look at Verizon's build out today, they've got a, a few major cities in the country that they're building out high band uh, infrastructure. So that has a lot of capacity, high speed, but that, that signal has to directly go to your smartphone. So if you if you ha happen to get in the way of that signal, you'll get no signal because uh, a millimeter wave uh, frequency will not go through your body. It doesn't penetrate water. And so the first thing that we determined was if we were going to build out a nationwide network that you needed to have two of the other bands that actually 5G brings in, and that is mid band uh, or, or the medium spectrum and low band, which is Traditionally, what's used today is low band spectrum. And so 
when you're thinking about a network, building a nationwide network, you need the best combination of coverage and capacity. And the way you get that is coverage is really about your map. Do you want to have a signal everywhere you go? And that's where we're talking about the 600 to 800 megahertz uh, spectrum. Really the only carrier that has uh, low band spectrum today is uh, T-Mobile. They bought um, a lot of the TV spectrum uh, when it was available. Then the only uh, carrier today that has a mid-band spectrum is also T-Mobile because they bought Sprint. So when you're looking at what is the what is the best combination in terms of spectrum you can have, it is really the low and mid band for a nationwide network. Now, if you're going to use high band, great. Put it in a stadium. Put it in a hospital. Uh, but don't try to build out a nationwide network with high band. No other nation in the world is trying to do that. And so, <clears throat> really, again, when you're thinking about infrastructure. You want low band and mid band. Now, the way that um, the way that Verizon is, is addressing this is they're repurposing some of their cellular spectrum uh, in the not low band, but kind of the lower mid band to be their coverage network, and then they're using high band, of course, as I said, in major metropolitan areas. What does that mean for the country? Well, it really means that you're only going to get the uh, ability to use that high speed wireless network in major metropolitan areas, that is not what 5G is built for. It's not built for your phone. And so the ability to have industrial parks be automated, um, the, the ability to have uh, autonomous vehicles, telemedicine, all of that relies on the ability to get this infrastructure out into the country more broadly and that requires that you use a combination of mid and low band. So the, the first thing that we determined in that study at the White House was we needed to get more mid band spectrum out there. And we needed, um, importantly, to have the radio um, uh, diversity to enable us to, to hit as much spectrum as we can because we needed to open up those pipes. This leads into a discussion on radios. Today, the major equipment providers are building radios for the major telecom providers. And so if you're looking to light up spectrum that's not uh, in an area that AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile owns, well, Ericsson and Nokia and Samsung aren't going to build those radios for you today. You're going to have to go look at some of the smaller providers. So we don't have really good diversity in the radio market to really enable us to capture this spectrum. In addition, the Defense Department um, in, in the area of spectrum has been working for a long time with something called dynamic spectrum sharing, the ability for many users to use um, same uh, spectrum. Now, this is kind of like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi you know, a lot of people share Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi is a very, very inefficient waveform and it's actually decades old, but there are new, um, uh, you know, essentially programs, software defined radios that allow you to access spectrum at the same time with multiple users. But who doesn't want to see this done? Well, of course, the owners of spectrum today, because they've spent billions of dollars on the spectrum. So they don't, because as you begin to share spectrum, it devalues that spectrum holding that you have. And so what the carriers would like to see today is that people stay on their toll roads. Now, that might be great for their business and um, in, in, in ensuring that they have essentially um, customer capture on their networks, but it's not the way to build out a, a industry 4.0 infrastructure. It's not going to lead America into the future. This is how, by the way, China is building their network. They are, they are taking the mid-band spectrum. They are forcing their telecom providers to build one network for both. So if you think about um, the spectrum capacity, and this really gets into the, the final piece about the radios, 5G enables you to utilize 500 megahertz 
uh, wide channels for um, for your network. And that means that you can get gigabytes per second speed on a mid-band network if you uh, enable the network to have access to all of that spectrum. But the way that the telecom providers today are building networks is that they're only using the, the spectrum that they bought. So say they bought 100 megahertz in the case of T-Mobile we just talked about. Their network will only ever be as big as that 100 megahertz allows them to. And uh, so when they when you look at the service to the customers, if you if you look at an industry where you have four major carriers and say each carrier is given 100 megahertz in that scenario of mid band spectrum, then each carrier will build a network. And that means that you have four times the capital expenditure and operation expenditure for those four networks. But because of the laws of physics, you will get one fourth of the capacity through those networks. And so what we are doing in the United States because of spectrum policy is essentially forcing our society to spend four times as much for its infrastructure to get one fourth the capability out of that infrastructure. Now, again, this is why China went and forced the telecom operators to share a network. They have that way, they in the, in the case of China, there's two operators. So, so they pay one half, if you think about it, the, the capital expenditure and operating expenditure because they're sharing the network, and they give their customers twice the capacity. So this is a kind of math that we should be into in the United States. And it was the main reason why we talked about a, a, a nationwide secure network because when we get into the other area of security, trying to secure those two different physically separate networks is much harder than trying to secure one network. Now, we have the need in the United States to provide secure traffic, as we just talked about in leading this off, and secure data for the federal government. But building a network for the federal government that same network can provide that same bandwidth to the commercial sector, private citizens. And so when you think about, you know, look at this in terms of the electrical grid. It is as if we are building four electrical grids in the United States. Now that might be good if you, um, if you want to, um, you know, have diverse infrastructure, but you see the expense and the comp the complexity that that causes. You know, the the entire idea of building infrastructure for the United States is to build it the most efficiently and effectively from a cost and a performance standpoint as you can. And so this idea of building um, physical networks separately for each carrier is a major, major problem for uh, the telecom industry. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, that they're all um, going broke, why AT&T bought Time Warner, why they are so slow to roll out new 5G capacity, because they have enormous debt loads that they use to build their own physical network. So again, this is a big, the big issue. Um, the other issue about security is the fact that we don't encrypt data. And so the data model that we have that are you know that that runs our traffic today is is really not um, conducive to protecting data. So imagine this if if you have oil in the ground and you could drill a hole anywhere on earth and tap into that oil what would be the reason or um, how, how would mineral rights work? How would property rights work? Well, you know they wouldn't because if anybody could tap a hole anywhere in the earth and tap into the, to the world's oil supply or natural gas supply, then the idea of private property and mineral rights would be absolutely um, worthless. It wouldn't work. Well, that's what we have today with our data model. You can tap into anything and you can basically suck the data out. Again, this is why China seeks to have this, this um, open model and seeks to dominate these standards because they, can, they know that they can, whatever they can get into, they can pull it out. 
So the idea is basically about taking our data model and transitioning it to a locked data model. Everything's encrypted, and the and then you create ownership by ensuring that whoever created that data has the keys to unlock that data, and they they can share that key on the basis of a trust relationship or some kind of contractual relationship. But it really starts uh, at the data model, and you have to build your network around that data model. So if you think about a network today, it's not just a radio network, which is what we talk about all the time. It's also, and this is my final point, it's about the compute. So today, when you think of the mobile internet economy, there's two components to it from a technology perspective. There is the network itself, which is primarily 4G LTE today. And then there is a computing platform, which is primarily the mobile um, smartphone. So 4G was built for the smartphone. What 5G is, is not a network for the smartphone. Phone, it is a network for a different type of computing platform, and that's called edge compute. The reason it's called edge compute is because those high-powered servers that are in data centers today are taken out of those data centers, and they're placed close to the radio traffic so that you can assure that things like autonomous vehicles have that real-time line speed processing of data that those, uh, that those systems need to, in order to promote safety, in order to do things like remote surgery. All of these things require a, a, a symbiotic and very close integration between the radio and the compute. So 5G is not about the smartphone. 5G is really about the smart city. It's about the smart factory. And so, you know, I'll, I'll just go over really quickly um, the way we look at the infrastructure because we've tried to take this down to um you know rather than trying to boil the ocean let's just demonstrate how this can work for a community for an industrial park for a retail park for a a, a hospital sorry let me let me ask you we have a latency sure. problem <laughs> let me let me ask you a question before we go into that you know i'm stunned when i uh, sit home and watch a football game and everybody says we have the best 5G network in the US, right? Where, you know, you and I know that there's very little real 5G in the US. How does that work? Because it's really hard to get people to support your vision and to understand the threat to our country when you, when you, when you constantly hear that everything's fine. Well, I mean, I think the problem is, and, uh, you know, having looked at this for several years now, um, 4G really took off uh, on the basis of consumer adoption. And it was really consumers adopting smartphones. If you go back to the beginning in 2007, when the iPhone came out, Steve Ballmer said, um, you know, who's going to buy that $500 subsidized device? Well, Steve Jobs bet that everybody would. And of course, he would, ended up being right. So that transformed the the um, the e economy world. And uh, what 5G is though, it's not a consumer adoption technology. It's actually a community and an enterprise adoption technology. And so you have to make it easy for enterprises and communities to adopt. Well, the 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 telecom carriers don't make it easy for communities or enterprises to adopt. Just go ask any rural community who's been trying to get any of the top four to service them for the last two decades. It's not happening. And that's because of a combination of our policy and the way that the the, the um, telecom providers are, are designed. They are consumer-based technologies. They do not focus on the enterprise or the community. And so you have to have a different way of providing that ability to adopt the 5G world um, when you have the major providers that are just not doing that. So I just wanted to show the way we look at this. So we call this um, the sky spot. And, uh, and really, it, it, it is a combination of the things that I talk about. Uh, it's a combination of the radio, it's a combination of the compute, 
the interesting thing about what we've done here is to take this and make it EMP hardened. So not only will this um, protect your data because all data inside this is encrypted, but it will also withstand an EMP attack, and uh, and that includes a solar flare. So today, our telecommunications networks aren't designed to protect from uh, EMP attack and to be resilient to solar flares. Now, the way we've designed this is that so that a community or a, or a real estate developer can adopt this and essentially get this for one low monthly licensing fee. So down in the bottom here, we have a micro data center. So this is where we house the 5G radio. So remember the mid band and the low band that I talked about? This, here, this has a, both a mid band and a low band radio, which means that you have high capacity coverage within a certain um, you know, five to 10 kilometer range. And then you have a, a, a low band capacity out to almost a 20 kilometer range. So this allows you to basically automate the functions of a, in a community, in an industrial park, in a hospital, to do those things that you're trying to do. The, the high speed compute is really high performance computing that enables you to run real time line speed applications like uh, logistics, transportation, and, and telemedicine. On the top, what we have here is an array of technologies. So um, you have essentially laser connection for extending this. So we can create an extension of this, another pole without all the um, compute in it, to let, enable you to send this signal to another pole that's about 24 kilometers away. And it works per, fairly good even in weather. If you have weather, we have millimeter links that basically extends that. So the speed that we can extend this, this, this network, which has, you know, has fiber and power to it, is at 20 gigabytes per second uh, with the laser and 10 gigabytes per second with the millimeter wave. So you can go out uh, pretty good. And then you have 5G antennas for both the low band and mid band and then we have some other features like uh, if you um, for the government we have this counter UAS capability with radar built into it and then the very top you have a, um, a satellite backhaul antenna for those areas that don't have fiber or if you need a backup if the fiber goes out so we've made this um, to a military specification but it's it's at a price point that communities and um, industrial parks can adopt. So, you know, sure. my my goal to go after this, after looking at it for so long and being frustrated with um, the way that things are going, is to really recognize that um, the you, you can't get government to change. You have to come out and dis disrupt um, the industry in a way that um, that people aren't expecting, and that provides. Um, an ability for enterprises and communities to adopt. So um, that's uh, really what I had to say, and I'd love to answer any questions that people may have. That's great. Really appreciate it. One of the things I wanted to do really quickly is to, is to uh, highlight your book again, Rob, uh, Stealth War, um, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. Um, we have a number of signed copies here, so anybody who's watching and who would like to get a copy, please uh, please provide it. Are there any any questions? We're nearing the end of the session. That was fantastic because one of the things that you know I think as I um as I listen to you and I listen, you know, you and I have talked for a long time is that this really is a challenge for us and we're not responding to the challenge. What's the one action maybe that the country could take to get people moving? I mean, one of the things that I'm fascinated by. Uh, again, uh, um, Michael Woods from South Korea, um, others, this, it's, it's so hard for us to invest in broadband around the country. It's taking so long. You know, your point, I think, is that the carriers are not helpful, but I wonder if there's a role for the federal government to play, and I wonder who would play that role in the federal government to get things moving. Yeah, there's two things. I would really open up um, spectrum for dynamic sharing. I think that's uh, the, the technology is there um, and uh, and that would enable a, a lot of innovation to come to the market. The other is in the radio. 
I would really put government money to um, to to building radios that access a lot more spectrum than the radios currently designed for specific channels uh, that the, uh, the the telecom providers own, and then really open that up so that you know ORAN open uh, radio access networking architecture uh, is there, but we're not spending enough money to develop it. And so if we could if we could really open up the development of those radios. The other thing that I didn't mention with the radios is power. So the FCC restricts above 2.7 gigahertz uh, to essentially five watts of power. So um, Sprint can put out its signal, or, or now T-Mobile, at 2.5 gigahertz. What they bought uh, when they bought Sprint, they can put that out at 20 watts. Whereas you know anybody using CBRS or any of the other midband um, can only put out five watts, which really restricts the range that you can you can get out of that system. So it's about power, and when you build radios that access a lot of spectrum, the more power you put in them, the harder it is to to really get those radios to be interference free. So um, that that requires investment, uh, and it requires investment by the federal government, which the government used to do. It used to be putting money into Bell Labs, but you know, quite frankly, after the end of the Cold War, we stopped doing that. Listen, this is really helpful. We could go on. There's a huge number of questions, but our time is up. And I really want to thank you again, Rob, for your your generosity uh, and also your um, your patriotism in terms of working through these issues and trying to get this going. This is a big issue that we need to address as, as a country. And one of the things that you know we're suggesting that the Biden administration do is a 5G network uh, uh, nationwide as a way of addressing rural and urban broadband issues and bringing us all together. So we can have another conversation about that uh, a little bit later. But thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. And thanks for all the good work that you're, you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Norm.